Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay. Hey guys. First video of the day. So I was under the impression that Hungary was not a country. Excuse me, during World War I. But I have a feeling I know where he's going here. And um, if you're new, my name's Connor. Hello, where are my manners? I like to learn about history. Do YouTube recommendations. Original link to the video, top of the description. Right below that, link to the Discord. Love to have you. Click on it. Send you right over there. More the merrier. Pull up a chair, my friend. And right under that is uh, will be the link to my second channel, Mr. McJibbon, where I do more non-history-related content. You know, sports, stand-up, stuff like that. And so I, I think I know where he's going here. I, I learned a bit ago. I, I don't think it was in a reaction video. I think it was just I was just curious, and I wanted to know how the Austrian Empire became the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Austria wasn't was becoming more and more weak. The Austrian Empire and Hungary was the biggest region or faction within the Austrian Empire that wanted independence and. There was a lot of back and forth over years, and eventually they agreed that they would make Austria hungry, but the Austrian emperor would still be sort of the emperor of both, and so they were the Austro Hungarian Empire. I hope I'm not too wrong there, but I think that was the gist. So I think he's going to go into, you know, the people within the Hungarian faction area of the Austro Hungarian Empire and uh, how they felt about the war. That's my guess. Let's get into it. If you are not ready to learn, you know the drill. If you don't, you're in the wrong class. There's the door. Homac is down the hall. Make me some lasagna. That'd be nice. Okay, go. The Kingdom of Hungary in World War I, the Great War Special, Indy Nidale, go. The nation that initially declared this war was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who declared war on Serbia. Right. The rest of the world was soon involved. Today, I'm going to look at the Habsburg Empire, but mostly just one part of it. Today, I'm going to talk about Hungary. Pay attention. Phones away. off you need to do the same phones away go i'm indy nidell welcome to a great war special episode about the kingdom of hungary and world war one now in 1867, the Austro-Hungarian Compromise established the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary. Under one monarch, This right. partially re-established the sovereignty of the Kingdom of Hungary, and Emperor Franz Joseph was crowned King of Hungary, which he had not been between 1849 and 1867. Under the Compromise, Austria and Hungary had separate parliaments which met in Vienna and Budapest, but they did have three common ministries, those of foreign affairs, defense, and finance. Franz Joseph was the supreme warlord, and he also had the right to dissolve the National Assembly, to veto any laws passed by the National Assembly, and to appoint or dismiss any members of the Cabinet Council. All right, so that was the big catch, all the vetoing, which he did a lot, which I learned in the other video. I forget where what video it was, but it was a good video. I, But it seems like Austria really didn't have much power going into the split into Austria-Hungary, and that if Hungary really did want to secede, there's not really much Austria could do about it. That's at least what I remember from that video that I'm forgetting, that I really wish I remembered what it was where I learned this. I, it, it, it was within the past week. Week tops. And they eventually ended up settling on what Indy just said, but the king ended up having all that veto power, and so I think um, very clever on uh, Austria's part, the king. 
The nearly 50 years of the compromise before the First World War were pretty peaceful, and Hungary underwent considerable economic and social development. Also, from 1849, when 200,000 Russian troops had helped the Austrians defeat the Hungarians in the Hungarian Revolution and War for Independence, until December 1914, when the Russians invaded the Usak Pass, no foreign army invaded Hungarian territory. The Who's the famous psychologist who came out of Austro-Hungary. They also mentioned him in that video. Psychoanalysis Freud? No? Invaded the Usak Pass, no foreign army invaded Hungarian territory. The only real military action was the occupation of Bosnia Herzegovina in 1878, and that resulted in fewer than a thousand dead on the Austro Hungarian side. Still, in spite of the years of peace, there were big problems within the empire. It was incredibly multi ethnic, and all of those ethnicities were only held together by the sovereign, and it was in need of real reform. We've mentioned in regular episodes the enormous language difficulties plaguing the armed forces of the empire. Fifteen different language versions of the national anthem. Independence movements above pretty much every ethnic group of the empire. Also, ethnic groups like Italians or Romanians that wanted to actually belong to another nation. So in spite of the years of peace, it was a mess internally. It also had an emperor who, by 1914, was 84 years old and had been on the throne for close to 70 years and who was in many ways a relic of a Europe that no longer existed. Anyhow, back to Hungary, the army, and the outbreak of the war. The land forces of the empire were in three separate armies. The common army recruited from Austrian and Hungarian parts of the empire, the Austrian Landwehr from the Germanic provinces, and the Hungarian Honved. According to the 1867 agreement, Hungarians were allowed to raise and maintain their own armed forces. In actual practice during the war, all three armies fought side by side, though they had different nomenclature. Imperial and royal, Kaiserlich und Königlich. Imperial Royal, Kaiserlich Königlich, and Major Kerali, Royal Hungarian. At mobilization, the Hongved infantry was made up of 32 regiments, known by their garrison headquarters names. For example, there was the Miskolci Royal Hungarian 10th Infantry Regiment. Croatian troops were part of the Hungarian army, and they served in Croatia, which was subordinate to Hungary in the empire. Those units took on Croatian names. Now, we'll talk about them and other troops such as Slovenians in other special episodes. After the assassination of Franz Ferdinand and during the July crisis, Austro-Hungarian Army Chief of Staff Konrad von Hotzendorf did not experience much resistance to his plans for war with Serbia. Pretty much the lone voice of opposition was Hungarian Prime Minister Istvan Tissa. Already on July 1st, just days after the assassination, he wrote a memorandum to Franz Joseph stating that a hasty, aggressive move on Serbia would be a fatal error. As Romania was lost to the Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy, and as potential ally Bulgaria was weakened by the Second Balkan War, Tissa felt as Romania was lost to the Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy, and as potential ally Bulgaria was weakened by the Second Balkan War, Tissa felt that the time was totally unfavorable for war. Once Germany expressed its support for Franz Joseph, and once the cabinet passed a resolution that in the event of a war, Austria-Hungary would not annex Serbian territory, Tissa conceded. And then the war began, and Hungarian soldiers were immediately involved. Of course, they were involved in the disastrous invasion attempts of Serbia, which led in just a few months to hundreds of thousands of Austro-Hungarian casualties. However, there was Austro-Hungarian military participation early on over on the Western Front. Yep. So if, um, if Russia did not have an alliance, this isn't a blame game sort of thing. I'm not, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, where I used to talk about my, one of my more favorite essay subjects about trying to argue whether you like it or not, you got to pick one and argue who was the main cause of World War One. I'm not talking about that. This is just a, a question of. If Russia did not have an alliance or a pact to protect Serbia in case of Austro Austro Hungarian Austro Hungarian aggression, 
then would World War One not have happened? Because I know Germany was telling Austria-Hungary that it would back it, back it up against Serbia, but I'm assuming that I don't think Austria-Hungary would have really needed help in attacking Serbia. I just thought it was more Germany saying, you know, if anyone else tries to intervene, we'll we'll say that we have your back. And so if Russia wasn't going to Serbia's aid, I don't know if Germany would have really helped Austria-Hungary, even if they did, because uh, France, I believe, was only dragged in. I don't think France had an alliance with Serbia. I just think, I'm not sure on that. But I believe France was just going to aid with Russia and wasn't a fan of Germany. Probably still hard feelings uh, since the Franco-Prussian War. Um, yeah, so just that was my question. I just wonder if Russia didn't have that alliance, would this just have been a smaller Balkan conflict? Hungarian military participation early on over on the Western Front. Yep, four Austro-Hungarian of Austro-Hungarian oh, casualties. However, there was Austro-Hungarian military participation early on over on the Western Front. Yep, four Austro-Hungarian heavy artillery batteries were loaned to the Germans for the invasion of Belgium. Something and is so cool about World War I artillery that it, it seems that World War II, they had it more streamlined and it looked slightly better. I, and it looked, it, it, I'm sure it was obviously decades later it was they were better quality and better technology but world war one artillery guns just look so scary you know just help take Liège, Namur, and Antwerp. They were even used during the first Battle of Ypres, but were sent to the Eastern Front to fight Russia in early 1915. In December 1914 came the Battle of Limanova, which was one of the greatest military victories in Hungarian history. On December 11th, three Hungarian Hussar regiments were given the task of strengthening the Jablonica Hill defenses and relieving their comrades. At 5 a.m., the 9th Hussars under Colonel Otmar Moore dismounted and made for the hill, but it had fallen to the Russians during the night, and a vicious melee ensued. The Hussars were cavalry, and their equipment wasn't really suitable for infantry combat, but fighting with whatever they could use, including their bare hands, they gained the upper hand. Colonel Moore was mortally wounded, but by 6 a.m., the Hussars had control of the hill. That was not the end of the fighting. Four Russian regiments tried to retake the hill a total of 15 times unsuccessfully. The Russian steamroller had been stopped. The Hungarians took casualties of around 12,000, the Russians around 30,000. Hungarian troops were also present at Przemysl Fortress during the long months it was under siege by the Russians. In fact, the 20th Szegedi Honved Division was down to only 2,662 survivors from 8,500 by the time they surrendered to the Russians. For their service, there is a monument at Margit Bridge in Budapest. The greatest number of Hungarian troops took part on the Italian front, and that's where the greatest number fell. I'll talk about notable Hungarian service there in regular episodes when we cover the major battles there in future. I need to learn, I'm going to do this after this, to learn more about the Italian, about Italy, from the Napoleonic Wars, maybe even before, onwards. So like, Italy, French Revolution to World War One. Sure. So I won't do that here. I'll also talk about the notable success of the 39th Honved Division that used newly developed shock tactics on the Romanian front, but we haven't gotten to that yet either. Three Austro-Hungarian divisions and a Hungarian one were also deployed on the Western Front in 1918 to beef up the German defenses there. I'm going to talk briefly about the immediate post-war situation of Hungary. It's very complicated. In mid-October 1918, the Hungarian government, with the emperor's consent, terminated the 1867 compromise. This happened the same day that Tiza was murdered. Many people felt that he had been responsible for the war, which is kind of ironic since he had been the voice of opposition back in 1914. On October 31st, Count Mihaly Karoli became the new Hungarian prime minister and demanded the immediate cessation of hostilities. The Hungarian Democratic Republic was proclaimed November 16th with Karoli as president. Universal suffrage, 
and freedoms of the press and assembly. Things got messy after that. There was the Hungarian-Romanian war for starters, which involved Bolsheviks, Hungarians attacking Czechoslovakia, and Romanian troops marching through Budapest. We will cover that in depth when we get there. It is totally not possible to do it here, but you have something to look forward to. The Treaty of Trianon, which came directly afterward, and which is a very divisive issue even today, was dictated by the Entente in 1920, and Hungary had no choice but to agree. It regulated the independent Hungary. It limited the army to 35,000 soldiers, including officers, but most importantly, it took away 67% of Hungarian lands, 60% of its population, 89% of the forests, 62% of the railways, and so forth. British Prime Minister Lloyd George had this to say. What I have said about the Germans is equally true about the Hungarians. There will never be peace in southeastern Europe if every little state now coming into being is to have a large Hungarian irredenta within its borders. I would therefore take as a guiding principle of the peace that as far as humanly possible, Possible that different races should be allocated to their motherland. That as far as humanly possible, the different races should be allocated to their motherland, and that this human criterion should have precedence over consideration of strategy, economics, or communications, which can usually be adjusted by other means. I'm going to leave it here because anything that came beyond that isn't really this channel's business. I love that, but that that. If you guys don't want to watch me go through this again, I, I, I'll let him. It's just a brief look at Hungary and Hungarian participants. So, great video. If you want to keep watching, if you're done, hey, great video. I'll see you guys next time with the next episode. But I really want to go through this one more time, this little bit at the end. Even today was dictated by the Entente in here. We will cover that in or two. I said issue even today, which came directly possible to do it here. But you have something to look forward to. The Treaty of Trianon, which came directly afterward and which is a very divisive issue even today, was dictated by the Entente in 1920. And Hungary had no choice but to agree. It regulated the independent Hungary. It limited the army to 35,000 soldiers, including officers, but most importantly, it took away 67% of Hungarian lands, 60% of its population, 89% of the forests, 62% of the railways, and so forth. 89% of the forests. So they basically got a very, you know, the urban area around Budapest and maybe some mountainous regions. And 89% of the forests, 62% of the railways, and so forth. British Prime Minister Lloyd George had this to say. What I have said about the Germans is equally true about the Hungarians. There will never be peace in southeastern Europe if every little state now coming into being is to have a large Hungarian irredenta within its borders. Irredenta. I just... Irredenta. I'm spelling that right? Uh, a nationalist, uh, a region that is under the political jurisdiction of one nation, but is related to another by reason of cultural, historic, and ethnic ties. Okay. So kind of like the, the Czechoslovakian deal with Germany at the very, very early stages before even World War I technically started, where, what was it, the Sudetenland? So, places where a part of a, an area, you know, and communities within one country are technically part of that country, but are culturally much more identifiable to other areas or another country around it. I think of Czechoslovakia with the what the uh, German army in 1938 or 39 uh, taking back the Sudetenland. I, if I'm wrong about the Sudetenland, the kind of outskirts of, of Czechoslovakia that bordered Germany. So that's what you're within its borders. There will never be peace in Southeastern Europe if every little state now coming into being is to have a large Hungarian 
Hungarian Irredenta within its borders. Okay. So a bunch of states around Hungary that are more identified with Hungary. I would prefer take, therefore, I would therefore take as a guiding pr principle of the peace. I would therefore take as a guiding principle of the peace that as far as humanly possible, the different races should be allocated to their motherland and that this human criterion should have precedence over consideration of strategy, economics, or communications. Which can okay, so he's basically saying if you want peace, stop thinking about the, the, your strategy and economics, your communications your strategy of making borders and first think about ethnic ties, um, ethnic, racial, cultural ties of a bunch of places and, and put them in their own country where they identify or else you're going to keep having wars, I, I guess is what he's, he's saying. Usually be adjusted by other means. I'm going to leave it here. I get what he's saying. Uh, he's saying that you know, like I think of Canada, this is way uh, different, but I, I know that I've told the story of me, my dad, and my brother uh, climbing Mount Katahdin, which is uh, a mountain in Maine. It's the tallest mountain in Maine. And uh, one of the ends, you know, the northern end of the Appalachian Trail and meeting uh, a few French, um, French Canadian people up there from Quebec because it's, it's probably closer to them than it was uh, to us in southern New England. But how, how they couldn't even understand it. and and I know how and we couldn't understand them you know it was that distinct it, it wasn't I, I always assumed you know I, I knew a lot of people in in that area of Canada Quebec spoke French I didn't realize how culturally distinct they were in that they spoke French they did not learn English at all they had no idea and just like we had like they we're as, about as good at English as we were at, at French, which is not good. And how the, them in Canada kind of see themselves as as different. That wouldn't be an irredenta, though, I guess, because that would mean that there is a surrounding area that is also French-speaking that they should be with. But I know that when there are two distinct cultures within a nation, they tend to want, they tend to think of each other as separate. I think that a lot of French Canadians see themselves as separate from the rest of Canada. I don't know if that's the best example. That's just one that's close to home and I had somewhat of an experience with. But he's saying that all of the, when you think of making borders, all of the economic and, and, and things that you would think of reasonable, sh they can be taken care of later. First, make sure that the borders correspond with culture and race, ethnicity and background on history and whatnot because that's always going to lead to future war and so think about the railroads and and all that stuff later make sure the borders encompass make sure that they do not leave people on the outskirts that adhere to the culture within the borders i i hope you get what i mean um so that's what he's saying i i guess that makes sense uh, at the time period awesome video Awesome. I knew I would be in for a, a treat of a video when I, I saw it was Hungary and Hungary wasn't its own nation. Interested in that. Cool. First video of the day. Sorry if I was a bit tired. I really did enjoy that though. Next video is Russia. I will be getting into that right now. See you guys next time.